Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A west side landmark, the Alazan Apache Courts, now designated as one of the 11 most endangered historic places in the country by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The San Antonio Housing Authority says that designation confirms what it already knew. But Jesse Degollado tells us what effect it will have on Saha's demolition and redevelopment plans. One of the first public housing projects in the nation and the first in San Antonio, Alessana Pache Courts now has another historic distinction. We are looking for places that are endangered. And obviously, the Alazan Apache courts are in danger of demolition. About 500 units in the Alazan section. That's still five to ten years away, according to the San Antonio Housing Authority. The cement cinder block units deemed too costly to upgrade and keep as affordable housing. They'll be rebuilt from the ground up. This is a community living in the poorest neighborhood, in the poorest zip code, in the poorest big city in America. They deserve better living standards. Um, I think uh, they've been waiting for a long time for this. But some residents say it's not about the buildings. I love the history. The history of it, you know, it inspires people. and inspires me to do better and to be better for my son. I love it. It's very quiet. It's very neighborly. We all get along. Preservation and progress are not mutually exclusive. And it's about allowing places that are valuable and meaningful to their communities to continue to evolve and change. In such a way, she says, that would best preserve Alasana Pache's character and history. Jesse De Ullado, KSAT 12 News. Governor Greg Abbott today proposing increasing penalties and even defining new crimes for actions during what are deemed riots. In a midday press conference today, the governor outlined a series of legislative proposals. They include mandatory jail time for hitting officers during a riot, making it a felony to use lasers to target police during riots, and even a new felony charge for what he said was aiding and abetting riots. Some people participate in riots without ever being there. What they do is they aid and they abet riots with funds or organizational assistance. This will be a felony that will lead to jail time. The governor also said he wants people charged with the offenses kept in jail at least until their first court appearance. And he wants the attorney general to be able to pursue civil penalties against people and organizations who assist in riots. A local activist who's organized peaceful protests in our area says the governor's proposals are proof that black lives don't matter to him. Those are her words. In addition to stricter penalties for rioters and looters, she feels legislation needs to be created to better protect the public against police officers who abuse their power. Devin Clark with her reaction tonight. We are not safe. Radical Registrar's founder and local activist Valerie Reifert says she understands how rioters and looters can distract from the message of the Black Lives Matter movement. But she says ignoring the reason behind the demonstrations that have sometimes been transformed by violence is harming society as well. I do not condone rioting or looting, but what I also don't condone is this habitual and constant repetition of history. The governor now proposing legislation which would intensify punishments for violent and destructive actions at protests, including assaulting police and blocking hospitals. Reifert says that addressing one result of the issue and not the root problem won't lead to equitable solutions and a society where everyone feels included. This keeps happening generation after generation and Governor Abbott is choosing to turn a blind eye as to why people are out here, you know, doing these things. Reifert believes new legislative proposals centered around current events need to address ways to help outraged communities heal and help improve the trust that some people lack in government systems. Well, the people who need the harsher laws and punishments is law enforcement. They um, are clearly taking advantage. And we do want to remind everyone that the governor's ideas are just legislative proposals. Before they become actionable, the bills must be passed by the House, the Senate, and then signed off by the governor himself. Reporting in the newsroom, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. New at 6 Bear County Sheriff's Office deputy out of a job after crashing her car. BCSO says 31 year old Simona Barone rolled her vehicle around 2 yesterday morning while she was off duty. 
San Antonio police responding to the scene and performing a field sobriety test on Barone. Right now, it's unclear what the results of that test were, but she was not arrested. BCSO telling us even though the case didn't result in criminal charges, Sheriff Javier Salazar still chose to terminate Barone, adding she had not given a good performance during her, her probationary period. Three people facing charges in a case of a man shot dead earlier this week inside his car. Police calling this capital murder and saying that he was being robbed at the time. As Katrina Weber reports, police say the arrest of the latest suspect came about with help from one of his alleged partners in crime. In the middle of a far west side parking lot, San Antonio police found themselves at square one in a murder investigation. They found 20 year old Miguel Carvajal Jr. inside a parked car Tuesday evening, dead from gunshot wounds. Through a witness, they say they learned there were three men involved, two posing as customers out to buy drugs, but then robbing him. They say at least one had a gun and shot Carvajal as he reached for his own. An arrest affidavit says detectives believe 18 year old Trayvon Cheney was one of those men. Police identified the two others as 18 year old AVR Smith and 19 year old Roger Coons. All three are charged with capital murder. In the affidavit, police say both their investigative work and a bit of electronics are what led them to Cheney. They say he was wearing an ankle monitor at the time and data from that placed him at the scene of the murder. In addition, police say one of the other suspects pointed the finger at Cheney. Police say, as it turns out, one of them also suffered a gunshot wound. They say the victim, Miguel Carvajal, had managed to fire back at them just before he died. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at time saver traffic right now. Here's the Transguide camera 410 in Fredericksburg. You can see traffic in both directions. Looks like even on the access roads and on ramps as well moving smoothly this evening. New at six this weekend, Willie Nelson will host the 35th annual Farm Aid concert to raise money for American farmers. He'll be joined by a couple dozen other entertainers in a three hour show that will be different, a lot different from past shows. Paul Venema explains. Whiskey River, take my mind. Willie, as always, will headline the show. No doubt he'll open with his trademark show opener, Whiskey River. But that's where the similarity to shows past ends. Due to the pandemic, the entire show will be virtual. No big crowds, but still fan enthusiasm and the commitment from the entertainers. They've uh, helped farmers for 35 years. They've raised almost $60 million uh, to help out the family farms. <laughs> To help not only by raising money, but by raising awareness of the plight of American farmers like Angie Provost. This year has been challenging for us all with the pandemic and economic and food insecurity. But given these obstacles, we continue to farm to nourish ourselves and our communities. Among the entertainers, Chris Voss from The Record Company. He has a personal connection to farmers, having grown up on a dairy farm. And he has his grandfather's hat to prove it. This hat was, <clears throat> was my grandpa's. Look at it. He was a farmer. Farm Aid 2020. The show will be available on Farm Aid's YouTube channel, Access TV, and multiple other platforms. Aside from Willie, it'll feature his sons, Lucas and Micah, and at least 20 other artists. Paul Venom, a case at 12 News. The Will Smith Zoo School, the San Antonio Zoo, getting a huge boost. Today, the Texas Cavaliers donated $1,050,000 to the school. School officials say that money will be used to help them reach a goal of having 30% student enrollment through tuition assistance. Members of the Texas Cavaliers say the pandemic made it hard to raise money, but they still got the job done. We uh, doubled down on our efforts, uh, knowing that this mission is critical to the future generations of children in this community and the surrounding areas. And uh, we're just uh, we're extremely proud to, to be able to make this uh, sizable donation that will really make a difference. The Texas Cavaliers Charitable Foundation has been raising money to benefit kids across the state since 1989.
Look outside with live cam this evening. 84 degrees out there all around. Just a pleasant day, Adam. It was beautiful. Yeah, it really was. We had some nice clouds early in the morning. They broke. Then we had a good amount of afternoon sunshine, so we made it into the mid 80s around San Antonio, but warmer temperatures off to the west. The aquifer down just a touch today, a tenth of a foot to 664.0. Still stage one watering restrictions out there. Ragweed moderate, mold on the low end, the count of 390. Taking a look at readings right now, 91 in Hondo, 89 Castroville, but only 82 at Randolph, along with Bulverde, 84 New Braunfels and 84 at the airport in San Antonio. This evening, Beautiful, a calm wind, clear sky, a bit of humidity in the air, but it's not overwhelming. The temperature is gradually falling through the 70s. As for rain chances the next several days, looking pretty bleak. 10% chance as we get into Sunday, Monday time frame, and that's as a result of a cold front that's going to pay us a visit. I'll let you know when you can expect more fall like conditions and what kind of impact that front's going to have on temperatures coming right up. We are just seconds away from today's daily briefing as we wait to see what impact we could see locally from Labor Day when it comes to COVID-19. Yep, let's go to the city hall to city hall right now where we're expecting to hear from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf. Commissioner Justin Rodriguez, along with Dr. Joan DeWu, who is our medical director for San Antonio Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. We're reporting 177 new cases of COVID-19 this evening, which brings our total since the pandemic began to 53,971. Our new seven-day moving average remains at 50, well, excuse me, at 153. Unfortunately, we have five new deaths to report tonight that happened within the last two weeks, including a young woman under the age of 19. Um, she passed away at home. And, you know, <laughs> each one of these deaths is tragic. It's a, a neighbor, a family member, a loved one, a friend. Uh, and so it hurts just to say those world, words. So please join us all in, in saying a prayer for their families tonight uh, and those who have, they have left behind. Um, that brings a total number of deaths in our community since the pandemic began to 1,073. And as you know, there's still a few that we are investigating that are reported by the state through death certificates, but these are the verified deaths that have occurred in our community since the pandemic started. Tonight, there are 231 COVID patients in the hospital, which is up three from yesterday. There are 25 new COVID-related admissions to the hospitals, down five from yesterday. And we have 87 patients this evening in the ICU, 36 patients on ventilators. 73% of ventilators are available and 12% of staffed hospital beds are available in our system. We do want to provide you with an update on COVID-19 in our schools, area schools. So here are the current numbers that have been verified by Metro Health. Uh, across our area, 20 students have tested positive at this point, 32 staff, and that's 15 teaching staff as well as 17 non-teaching staff have tested positive. Uh, we're presenting these numbers because we've gotten a lot of questions about how is this affecting our schools. As you know, we are not yet to full occupancy, so these numbers are, are low and they could be encouraging, although we need to be vigilant and watch them closely. As you know, most schools, districts, right now are offering some form of in-classroom learning. So it's not surprising to see some level of transmission there, uh, but we want to make sure that we keep an eye on that data and provide you with updates as we move along to keep everyone in our community safe. Let me turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Great. Thank you, Mayor. I uh, wanted to highlight one particular trend line with respect to the numbers tonight. Um, a little bit troubling, but you know, just something to keep our eye on is the hospitalization rate. Uh, if you recall, we had a steady decrease from a high of about 1,200 back in July uh, to a recent low of 210 just about a week ago. That was on September 16th. Uh, since then, over the past week, the last few days, uh, things have ticked up and the numbers stayed pretty consistent around that 230 uh, range. So we want to keep an eye on uh, the hospitalization rate. And it's a good reminder that we're uh, certainly not out of the high stress zone for our hospital system. So please, uh, uh, as a reminder to, to uh, follow the guidance of our public health professionals. Uh, three quick reminders in terms of what's happening uh, countywide. A uh, reminder to get your flu shots. I mentioned last time I was here last week, the county is co-hosting a drive-through 
flu shot event this Saturday. Um, good news is the the uh, or good and bad, I guess the, the all 3,500 slots are filled. Uh, that's for this Saturday at Freeman. Uh, the better news is that we'll be announcing a similar event on the west side that'll take place October 10th, and I'll keep you posted on that. But those that have registered already for this Saturday, please show up. Um, thank you to our partners, HEB and UHS. Uh, a re reminder that county parks reopen on Monday, September 28th. Most outdoor activities can resume, basketball, tennis, uh, rental of the pavilions, playgrounds. Of course, if you rent a pavilion, reminder that it's small gatherings only, and again, follow the healthcare uh, professional's guidance. Lastly, the, the county will be distributing again another 250,000 face masks to small businesses. Each business is eligible for 100 masks each, and distribution will take place on Thursday, October 8th from uh, 10 to one at the Freeman. And a, and a reminder is that you must register in advance as well for that at bear.org. That's all I've got, Mayor. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And as you know, this has been a health crisis, but it's also been an economic crisis, not just for San Antonio, but across the country. Here in San Antonio, we've had over 150,000 of our neighbors and loved ones file for unemployment. And as we know from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, many of those jobs are not coming back. So the city and the county have been working together to establish a job training program that's underway right now. And if you've lost a job, if you've lost income because of COVID-19, you can enroll in that program, receive a stipend as you get trained for jobs that are available right now. You can learn more about the program and get back uh, to work uh, through that job training program by calling 210-224-HELP. Uh, That's again 210-224-HELP uh, again to learn more and, and get enrolled in that job training program that's currently underway with the city and the county. There's also on our website covid19.sanantonio.gov the latest information on the pandemic here in our community as well as other assistance programs such as help paying rent and mortgage, et cetera. Uh, as always, you can get the latest on COVID-19 also by texting COSAGOV to 55000 or by going to the website again, that's covid19.sanantonio.gov. 177 new COVID-19 cases reported today, five new deaths, and certainly a really uh, eye-opening piece of information we heard from the mayor today. One of those people who died was a young girl under the age of 19, younger than 19 years old. So that's certainly a reminder uh, that this illness can affect anybody, no matter the age, uh, no matter where you come from or what your situation may be. Uh, but five people have died since the last update. And apparently she died at home. At home. So yes. that's a warning for young people out there. Uh, also, uh, Commis Commissioner Justin Rodriguez mentioning that county park facilities would be reopening September 28th, including pavilions, tennis courts, basketball courts, playgrounds, those kind of things. All right, certainly a great day to go out and enjoy some of the amenities yeah. at some of our parks. Or the case at Garden. Or the case at Garden. <laughs> I stuck yeah. a few minutes in today. It was nice out Did there. You? Yeah, the uh, orange trees are coming in nicely. We're having, we're gonna have uh -huh. a good crop this year. They got trimmed big time about a year ago or more, and then it, they didn't have a very good yield last winter. But this winter, I think it's gonna be pretty good. So that's fun. All right, nice. We're making orange juice for everybody, right? Yeah, sure. You bring the uh, mixer. I'll make the uh, orange hey, juice. Right? Hey. You heard it here. <laughs> right. it it's a partnership. It and, is. And I'll drink it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Way to pitch in. Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Spreester. Always so helpful. <laughs> Warming a little guys. bit in the days ahead. Then a cold front next week. But it's looking like a dry stretch of weather. So it's a good thing we've had some decent rainfall. I love this map. Take a look at this. This is the percent of normal precipitation over the past 30 days. So 100% would indicate average. Notice how a good chunk of South Texas is above 100%. So above normal in terms of the 30 day precipitation here in San Antonio. We're at 95%. So pretty much right on par. Pleasanton 221%. That's nice to see though. Looking forward, eh, rain chances are slim to none. We're looking at a 10% shot Sunday and into Monday, and that's a result of a cold front that's going to be headed our way right now. We're 77 in Dallas, 75 Houston. Meanwhile, 94 in El Paso, 92 in Amarillo and 84 here in San Antonio. Marfa stands out at 72. They've got some rain cooled air out there in West Texas. 90 right now in Catula, Hondo 91. Now, over the next couple of days, we'll be near 90 degrees, and I think even creeping into the lower 90s this weekend. Cold front, 
That's expected to arrive Monday morning. That'll be our transition day. In turn, temperatures starting to take a drop next week, and it's going to feel more fall like starting Monday afternoon. Until then, tomorrow morning, 63. Near 90 into the afternoon, a lot of sunshine, very similar this weekend. Then we get rid of the humidity and have some cooler mornings and afternoons next week. All right, we'll take it. Thanks, Adam. Well, we'll be right back with sports. When the fight Texas Aggies kick off their 2020 season this Saturday at Kyle Field, they'll be missing two key starters on offense and defense. Leading wide receiver Jamon Osmond opted out earlier to focus on preparing for the NFL draft. But this week, star linebacker Anthony Hines announced his decision to opt out of the season due to the COVID-19 pandemic and social injustice, saying his mind is not on football. Even with all that, the Aggies linebacking core remains confident. Yeah, I was a little surprised, but, you know, uh, mental health is very important. And, you know, uh, he know everyone on the team is 100 percent behind him. But, you know, I wish the best to him. And, you know, the good thing about football is it's not a one man sport. So if I were to opt out, you know, it's a team sport and, you know, the team is ready to go. And guys in that room have prepared to play. Coach Fisher, I always talk about don't just wait to play, prepare to play. And I think guys have been doing a phenomenal job of doing that. All right, the Aggies kick out their season against Vanderbilt this Saturday at 630 in College Station. Attendance will be limited for this game to 25 percent capacity. It's hard to believe that the Texas Longhorns have not started 2-0 since 2016 when Charlie Strong was a head coach, but they have a very good chance this Saturday of doing just that under head coach Tom Herman when the Horns travel to Lubbock to face Texas Tech in their Big 12 opener. That's because as of today, the Horns are 18-point favorites following their non-conference 59-3 win over UTEP almost two weeks ago now. Against Texas Tech in his last two starts, quarterback Sam Ellinger has thrown for a total of 757 yards, seven touchdowns, and not a single interception. And just because Tech narrowly beat Houston Baptist by two in their first game. Caden Stern says don't sleep on the Red Raiders. I'm sure obviously teams are going to improve as the a, as a, uh, year goes on and to keep people bought in is that you know we regardless of how other teams are playing we're going to go out there every week prepared and expecting that we're going to playing a top 10 team. All right kickoff on Saturday set for 2.30 in Lubbock. The UTSA Roadrunners will work on a short week coming off their 24-10 victory against Stephen F. Austin last Saturday. Now they'll open conference play tomorrow against Middle Tennessee after Memphis had to bow out due to the COVID-19 positive test. Now, one of the moves head coach Jeff Trader made since their season opening victory against Texas State is shifting Josh Otis to starting left tackle, something the 6'5", 330-pound lineman earned to start his senior season. That means a lot. Uh, I, does it, to me, it never really matter if I played or if I sat the bench. As long as the team won, it was best for the team. That's what I wanted to do. It was great. It was uh, great to be able to go out and uh, positively affect the game uh, and be part of the, the team, per se, that helps help us win. And Josh will try and do that again when the Roadrunners host the Blue Raiders to bar at 7 in the Dome. The big game and our big game coverage features the Steel Knights in their season opener against Life Christian Academy. Now, one of the reasons why we made this our big game is the fact that Steel is facing off against a team that is from Chester, Virginia. That's right. Not only from out of town, they're out of state. Life Christian Academy has been in existence for just two years, but travel is nothing new to them. The head coach arrived on Wednesday. The team touched down today. And get this, it's not their first trip to San Antonio. In our first year, we actually played Cornerstone. So we've been to San Antonio before. Um, so it's, it's a trip that we like. Um, and we'll come back every year if we, if we find opponents out here. That is awesome. Kickoff at Linhaw Stadium tomorrow night is set for 730. How about that? Now that's a road that. trip. That's <laughs> yeah. a road trip. Hey, if you can do it, do it. Why not? And uh, I know the, the, the fans of Steel are looking forward to this as well. Yeah. The fans are, and we welcome them. I'm not sure the Steel football team will be as <laughs> yeah, welcoming. Thanks, Greg. Sure. We'll be right back. Time now for today's KSAT Q&A. Every Thursday, we are joined by Dr. Ruth Berggren, infectious disease doctor from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, thanks as always for being with us. Uh, let's start talking about Labor Day. We have been waiting to see whether we're going to see any spike. We know that two weeks is kind of that timeline that's been eyeballed so many times. Do you think we should have seen a spike by now if we were going to, or do we still have to wait and watch those numbers? I think we still have to wait and watch the numbers. Um, if you look at hospitalizations, we're, we're seeing a leveling off. It's not continuing to plummet. And the uh, community positivity rate, which you recall was 
um, 6% last week is now at 6.4%. So I don't consider that to be an upward trend. It's sort of flat, um, but it also didn't keep going down. So you just got, you have to keep watching. Um, and again, the hospitalization rate for me is always a good indicator because um, the other tests, uh, the other numbers can be um, confusing depending on whether people who are asymptomatic are being tested or not and how many people are being tested at any given time. But um, the hospitalization rate uh, tells, a, tells a true story always. And um, so far, so good, but it still could go up again. And we just don't know how high. You know, one of the things we like to do with this case at Q&A segment, especially when we have you on, doctor, is separate the facts from some of the fiction that's out there. We were, it was reported today by the mayor that a uh, female under the age of 19 was one of the five deaths that were reported today. Uh, she passed away at home. This, I mean, it, we've been hearing so much about how this is something that doesn't affect young people. Clearly, it doesn't affect them as severely normally, but it does affect young people, correct? Oh, it absolutely does. And, you know, I've I've seen it myself. I'm rounding in the hospital these days. I'm seeing people in their early 20s very desperately ill with COVID. Um, and young people also can have underlying conditions. And people who have um, weight problem, obesity, serious obesity, or high blood pressure and all the other conditions you've heard about before, young people can have them too. But there's also been young people where it wasn't really obvious what their underlying condition was. And we're still learning about this virus. I'm hopeful that we will start to be able to be better predictors of who's really at risk and who's not. But by no means should people um, dismiss the notion of young people getting sick. They do get sick. Another big concern for parents when it comes to kids and young people is Halloween. That is not that far away. So a lot of people wondering, parents especially, how risky would trick or, trick, trick or treating be during this pandemic? So um, very timely question, of course. And just today, the American Academy of Pediatrics has put something out onto the web um, that is very helpful. And they don't come down with a yes or no on trick-or-treating, but they are very, very clear about how to make Halloween activities safe. And they are, of course, you can't stop the, the big three things of masking, washing, and six-foot distancing. Whatever you do for Halloween, those things still have to be going on. Um, they really are promoting outdoor activities and warning people not to do indoor haunted houses. And I think the old traditional Halloween evening of clumps of kids going along and pressing doorbells, maybe with sticky fingers and then putting <laughs> their hands in the jar, that is probably not what we want to see happening. And um, But there's a lot of ways that people can have a lot of fun and still observe Halloween traditions. And you know, my favorite is an outdoor um, costume parade. And it, you know, parades can be a problem too, but parades can also be done well if they're, if they're planned and supervised. And um, it, if it gets people outdoors, um, you still get the fun of being seen and seeing other people. Um, some people are talking about having events that may be in an outdoor field or in a parking lot where you can use paint or chalk to draw circles and designate family groups to stay in their circle. Um, you know, you could imagine where a parade happens and people march around the park or around the parking lot and then the families cluster together. Maybe there's some music or some events like that. So um, if there's going to be a, a desire to do a trick-or-treat type of experience, perhaps a family scavenger hunt um, for Halloween treats in the yard, a little bit like an Easter egg hunt. So, And then spooky movie night where uh, people can get together um, online and then everybody watches the same movie at the same time. Or um, I haven't seen this anywhere, but my, my idea that would be fun is an outdoor drive-in movie experience, um, a family-friendly spooky movie. So those are some thoughts and some ideas about how we can have a great time over Halloween and keep people safe. I love those ideas. One of the ones too that I saw was a guy built a, what he called a candy shoot and he stood at the top of the stairs. The chute was at the bottom. And he just 
put the candy in there and it goes right in the kids bag. So there's a lot of ways to be inventive and still get the spirit of Halloween. Yeah, I'm for the scavenger hunt because then mama knows where the candy's hidden. <laughs> <laughs> little perk. Candy is all over in the supermarkets right now, right? So people are actually starting to think about their Halloween and they're buying the candy. What are we going to do with it? Yeah. Dr. Ruth Berger, and appreciate it. And of course, you'll be joining us again tonight on the Night Beat. We'll see you then. Okay. We'll be right back. The Powerball hoping to make some buzz with a brand new look. The televised drawing will feature new balls, upgraded ball dispensing machines, and a new studio. The one minute show, which airs Wednesday and Saturday nights, will also feature new graphics and music. It is the first time the set has been updated since the show moved to Florida from Iowa. Did you know, Steve? It I didn't know that. Well, there you go. Hmm. The good news, the 28 year old game itself, it's not changing. You can expect to see the new design September 30th. It's that time of year when we start to see pumpkin spice everything. Oh, no. Yeah, lattes, muffins, cookies, and now pumpkin spice mac and cheese. Why? This may be where I draw the line. This should absolutely be where we draw the line. This was created by Kraft. The box comes with dry macaroni noodles and pumpkin spice flavored powder to add to the classic cheese powder. It also includes cinnamon to sprinkle on top oh. and a coffee mug. There's a catch though, only 1,000 people will actually get a box and it is only available in Canada. All right, maybe Canadians like it. There must be, <laughs> Kraft must think I guess they it, would be into that. I see Adam over there, Adam's like waiting to say something, but my thing is like, if you want a pumpkin spice something, get that, don't get mac and cheese. They're two exactly. different things. Don't ruin the mac and cheese. Yeah. That's my philosophy on a lot of uh, beer and breweries these days. <laughs> well, really, if I wanted, fudge, I'd go eat fudge, chocolate, you know? I hear you. I don't need it in the beer. Anyway, I hear you. I'm with you. Thank you. Exactly. Thanks. See, he's with me on something. Yeah, I agree with you on this one. Wow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, 85, that was our high today after a low of 62. And across the area, we did make it into the low 90s in Hondo, 92. 90 was a high in Carrizo Springs and Catula. And 81 for the high in Gonzales. And we will see a bit of a warming trend before our next cold front. Yes, our next cold front. It's just days away, and we're going to talk about that coming right up. Outside today, all around just pleasant out there, nice temperatures, but we know some changes are coming. They are coming, and it's Thermometer Thursday. It is. Oh, that's right. I can't believe I remembered. I know, right? I, I, and you didn't. Yeah, I'm not even wearing the tie in here, remembered. I actually have some calibration going on behind the scenes over there. Of course you This do. is a great, the studio is a great room to get the room temperature calibration point. Ah. So that's where I always do it, back up there, monitoring it very closely. But this is a unique thermometer Thursday. Kind of a sad one in a way. I'll tell you about it in a second. All right, let's take a look at the drought monitor. We have the newest one that just came in today as it does every Thursday. This is last week's, so I can give you something to compare it to. Last week's, and now I'm gonna show you this week's. And along the coastline, we wiped away all the drought and dryness, but we still have abnormally dry conditions throughout most of Bear County. And then you head westward, Uvalde to La Prior, Carrizo Springs. That's where we have the severe to extreme drought still in place. And we could obviously use some more rain. Unfortunately, odds are very slim here. We're looking at a 10% shot as we get into Monday, so maybe a few isolated showers then. But that would be a direct result of our next cold front, which should have a bigger impact on our conditions and especially our morning temperatures as we get into next week. Right now we're at 84, dew point is 62, a gentle northeasterly wind at six, and it's pretty much going to be calm the rest of the evening and tonight. So it's nice out there. Look at Bernie Stage Airfield, already dropped down to 79. Pleasanton's 84, 91 though in Hondo, 81 Bulverde in Canyon Lake. It's the type of weather pattern where once the sun sets with the clear skies, you see the temperatures fall off pretty quickly. So still 91 in Hondo, 90 in Catula, but before you know it, later on tonight, you'll be down in the 70s as well. The clouds are still hung up in East Texas, and we had some of them earlier today as well. They're slowly pushing eastward. It's still on the backside of what was Tropical Storm Beta, just few days ago. Now it's just a lot of rain remnant low that's moving over the southeastern United States, taking all that 
good rainfall even farther away from us. But I want to show you the big picture because this is really going to dictate what happens to our weather next week. The next couple of days and all the way through the weekend, just more sunshine and similar conditions. But notice how our pattern shifts and we get this big dip in the upper level flow early next week. That's enough to pull some colder air southward and make it all the way into Texas. This isn't going to be cold. You know, we're not talking freezing or frost or anything like that, but a noticeable impact to the temperatures and how it feels for a good chunk of next week. It looks like the effects of that cold front will be lasting for several days. As for tomorrow morning, 63 and partly cloudy to start the day, then a lot of sunshine near 90 into the afternoon. A south southeasterly breeze, and I do think most of us will be in the lower 60s to start the day, some mid 60s out there. Then by the afternoon, right up near the 90 degree mark here in town, New Braunfels at 90, Beeville about 91, but you get closer to the Rio Grande and mid 90. So cranking it up a little bit tomorrow, especially farther to the west. Then we get into the weekend. Humid mornings will give us low clouds to start the days. Then we get into the afternoon, we'll have sunshine and lower 90s. Cold front, that's expected to arrive by Monday morning. So Monday would be our transition day when you notice the wind really pick up and then the humidity plummet pretty quickly and conditions start changing. I think that's going to be Monday, but I still think we can make it up to about 82 degrees and then we sweep away the humidity Monday afternoon and it's going to stay that way for the rest of next week and that could call for mornings in the upper 60s even around San Antonio. There's a possibility um, of that happening. So that cold front right now the timing is Monday morning, but of course Things can change between now and then, so we'll all keep you updated. That's a deep sigh. Mm -hmm. You know, I come to this realization every so often. Oh. I make my thermometers in batches of about a half a dozen, give or take. And inevitably, within every batch, there's one or two just doesn't work out no. and I can do whatever I want. Try everything. Doesn't work out. So the other day, <laughs> our little sorry, I'm laughing. I think it was Myra's reaction that I found. <laughs> Thank you, fun. Myra. Steve's like, yeah, yeah, yeah give it to yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I didn't know Myra was water. such a, I didn't know Myra was such a thespian. I, so all of this work, on, no. blowing the glass, filling it with alcohol to the appropriate level, going through calibration. And then I find, oh, the resolution's too high, too high a resolution. So it can measure up to 100 max. That doesn't do us any good. Oh, resolution's too low. That doesn't do us any good, so on and so forth. So the other day, my wife comes out of the office because she's working from home these days and she's, um, you know, our craft room office. Um, honey, just uh, so you know, there's a lot of thermometers sitting around. I, I don't know if you need them. I got the hint. It's time to come to the realization. <sighs> I hate this. Oh. All of them. Oh, wow. Because I always think, oh, maybe I could do something with it. I could do, nope. Time to start over. At some point, you just have to clean the slate. So all that work, but it's just one or two in every batch. Look yep. at you. What I do have, though, is a really good one for Lucio Aguilar of San Antonio. I just sent you the email about an hour ago. You were the winner ah, of this beauty right here. So that's a good, good compromise of range and resolution. Yeah, just keep it far away from the trash can. This yeah. is a good one. Yep. Anyway, you're the winner. You go to kset.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. And, oh, I'm really excited for the ornaments this year. That's what I have calibrating, and it's going to be great. You're rebounding well. Yeah, you yes. are. I think you're going to make it. Yeah. Positivity. Okay. Think of it as quality control. That's right. what it is, really. Right. It really is. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning to you. It is Thursday. It is September 24th. Three men all facing capital murder charges in the shooting death of 20 year old Miguel Carvajal Jr. He was shot twice during a drug deal on the far west side on Tuesday. His body found inside a parked car in the 9800 block of Petranco Road. The witness identified all three suspects through video surveillance and a photo lineup. Investigators also linked Cheney to the scene through an ankle monitor he was wearing. Now, Texas will always defend the First Amendment right to peacefully protest, but Texas is not going to tolerate violence, vandalism, or rioting. Governor Greg Abbott today proposing increased and new penalties for actions during riots. 
for things like causing property damage, attacking police, or even what he said was to aid and abet a riot by providing funds or organizational support. Well, we have learned the name of a man killed while trying to cross Loop 410 last night. He's been identified as 17-year-old Damien Frank Escobar. San Antonio police say it happened around 11.30 last night on Southwest Loop 410 near Marbach Road. The driver did not see Escobar before she hit him. She did, however, stay at the scene to try and help and will not face any charges. The Will Smith Zoo School, the San Antonio Zoo, getting a huge boost. Today, the Texas Cavaliers donated $1,050,000 to the school. School officials say that money will be used to help them reach a goal of having 30% student enrollment through tuition assistance. Members of the Texas Cavaliers say the pandemic made it hard to raise money, but they still got the job done. Tomorrow, a good amount of sunshine, 63 at sunrise and then 84 into the afternoon. A light south-southeasterly breeze into the weekend. Morning clouds, but afternoon sun, low 90s and humid. Then next week, a little more fall-like because of a cold front. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.